And good afternoon. As we celebrate Indigenous History Month and yesterday, Indigenous Peoples Day, I'd like to acknowledge that the land we know as the Lake Simcoe watershed is the traditional territory of many nations of Indigenous people. We recognize this land as part of the William Treaties, including seven First Nations from the Chippewa of Lake Simcoe and the Mississauga of the North Shore of Lake Ontario. And we are grateful to these nations for the opportunity to settle here and share the land. I recognize and appreciate that each of you will have your own land acknowledgements depending where you are. Welcome everyone and thank you Kim uh, for, the, for these opening remarks. My name is Leslie Rich and I am the Policy and Planning Liaison with Conservation Ontario. Before, uh, before we get started, I just wanted to give you um, some, some oversight in terms of what, uh, what to expect as part of the webinar. So today's webinar will include a short presentation from staff at AMO and Conservation Ontario. And following the presentation, the speakers will respond to questions posed by the participants through the Q&A box. A few help housekeeping notes before we begin. First of all, all of our attendees are muted and you'll not be able to speak or come on video. You will find a Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. At any time during the webinar, I encourage you to type your questions in the box and press enter to have it posted. You can provide an upvote of a question you would like by pressing the thumbs up button. We'll be reviewing the questions and we'll have time to pose some of them to our, our speakers during the discussion. And please feel free to interact with others in the webinar through the, through the chat function. The webinar is being recorded so that others who are not able to attend will be able to listen in uh, when they can. So welcome everybody. And it is my pleasure uh, to have municipal staff and then leadership and conservation authority staff and leadership attend this webinar today. Back to Kim. Thanks very, thanks very much, Leslie. Uh, Nick, let's take a look at the results of our poll, please. Can you see them, Kim? Yes, we do. Thank you very much. So we can see that we have a fair number of people from Southwestern Ontario and Central Ontario, but really from all, all areas. Thanks very much, Nick. I'm gonna to start today by introducing Amber Crawford. Amber Crawford is a senior advisor with the Association of Municipalities of Ontario, providing expertise to Ontario's 444 municipal governments for over five years. In this role, Amber develops policy and, and municipal sector, excuse me, policy and advocacy related to natural environment, climate change and energy on behalf of the municipal sector. Prior to joining AMO, Amber worked as a consultant at a government relations firm, the Ontario Ministry of Labour and Human Resources and Skills Development Canada. Amber is completing a master's of planning degree at the University of Guelph. She graduated with a master's degree in public policy and administration from Culture University and has a bachelor's degree in political science from Western University. Second, I wanna introduce Leslie Rich, policy and planning specialist for Conservation Ontario the Association for Ontario's 36 Conservation Authorities. She has been with Conservation Ontario for 11 years, and her work focuses primarily on supporting CAs in their role in planning Section 28 regulations and, reg and regulatory compliance. Since 2015, there has been a particular focus on reviews of the Conservation Authorities Act. Previously, Leslie worked for two CAs and a municipality. She has a Master's of Environmental Studies from the University of Waterloo, and is a registered professional planner. Thank you. Thank 
Okay. Thanks very much, uh, Kim. So uh, good afternoon, everybody. Sorry, Leslie, just um, if you can put it to the full screen. Okay, sorry, there's always got to be some. That's okay, no worries. <laughs> Perfect. Is that looking better? Great. Great. All right, well, good afternoon, and thank you everyone for joining us uh, on a second webinar related to the new Conservation Authorities Act regulations. So it's my privilege to be joined today by Amber Crawford and Leanne Soter from AMO, as well as my colleagues, uh, Kim Gavin, who you've met already, and Bonnie Fox from Conservation Ontario. So today's webinar will focus on the phase one regulations released by MECP in 2021 and the progress of conservation authorities through the transition period. It is anticipated that a future webinar related to the phase two regulations dealing with the budget and apportionment regulation in particular will take place in early 2023. So before we get into a discussion on the second phase of the transition period, we thought it would be helpful to provide a bit of background of where we came from and how we arrived in the second phase of the transition period. So as you're likely aware, recent amendments to the Conservation Authorities Act brought into effect key changes to the way that the Conservation Authorities deliver the Act, including the concept of mandatory municipal and other programs and services. And sometimes these are referred to as category one, two, and three. There's new requirements uh, for transition, for a transition plan and changes to the Conservation Authority Board Governance. In January 2021, a multi-stakeholder Conservation Authorities Act working group was established to provide advice to the government as it relates to the phase one and phase two regulations. So members of that group included representatives from the Association of Municipalities of Ontario, the Development Industry, Agriculture and Conservation Ontario. In May 2021, the Conservation Authorities Act phase one regulatory proposal was posted onto the Environmental Registry for consultation. In addition, the Ministry of Environment, Conservation and Parks held a number of sessions with the stakeholders regarding the proposed regulations. So finally, in October 2021, a decision notice was posted and the phase one regulations were formally released. The majority of the regulations came into effect on January 1st, 2022, with the exception of the regulation which relates, relates to the rules of conduct in conservation areas. So participants today may be wondering, what are the overarching goals of the phase one regulations? The phase one regulations provided a framework for discussions and consultation with municipalities on CA program and services. While conservation authorities and their municipal partners have been working on transitioning on um, many matters to date, the transition to the new funding model for conservation authority programs and services does represent a shift in how CAs work with their municipal partners. Additionally, uh, in the words of the province, the new regulations are intended to provide municipalities with greater control over what CA programs and services they will fund. And ultimately, the goals of the phase one regulations are to provide uh, direction to conservation authorities on how to effectively transition over to the new legislative framework on the Conservation Authorities Act. So where are we now in terms of the transition period? The first phase of the transition period required the conservation authorities to complete a transition plan, as well as an original inventory of programs and services. As part of that inventory, conservation authorities were required to identify what agreements they had in place and which agreements that they would seek to enter into uh, by the end of the transition period. Throughout the second phase of the, trans uh, second phase of the transition period, um, the period that we're currently in, CAs are required to consult on their inventories, seek to enter into category three agreements, and to submit quarterly progress reports to the MECP, all of which would be subject to uh, additional discussion later on in this webinar. It's important to note that while there is no requirement to enter into category two, otherwise known as municipal agreements throughout the transition period, there is a requirement to have these agreements in place under the budget and apportionment regulation by January 1st, 2024. So for the purpose of this webinar, 
we will indicate that both category two and category three, otherwise known as municipal and other programs and services agreements are to be completed as part of the transition period. So zooming in now, let's look more closely at the consultation phase. The, the screenshot uh, that you see on your slide provides an example of a Conservation Authority program and service inventory that is available on their website. So throughout the second phase of the transition period, Conservation Authorities will be util utilizing the first draft of their inventory to consult locally with their municipal partners. Through the consultation, Conservation Authorities and municipalities will identify any agreements that will need to be updated or entered into to reflect the new requirements of the Act and the regulations. So while conservation authorities may be discussing agreements with their municipal partners, it is important to note that there's no requirement to enter into an agreement for the delivery of mandatory programs and services, which we'll cover in future slides, or for services that municipalities provide to the conservation authority through this new regulatory requirement. Moving along, now that we know to expect ongoing consultation regarding the inventory of programs and services, let's turn our collective attention to the next key element within the second phase of the transition period, and that's entering into agreements. As we identified at the outset, we will include both category two, municipal and category three, other, um, when referring to entering into agreements during the transition period. So let's take a closer look in terms of what I mean for category one, two, and three programs and services. For those of you who are able to attend our original webinar, you may be familiar with this, uh, with this slide. So essentially the amendments to the Conservation Authorities Act that were made as part of the Protect, Support and Recover from COVID-19 Act in 2020 included a repeal of the previous um, section related to the programs and services for conservation authorities and further refined the three categories of programs and services which can be offered by a conservation authority in its watershed. When we are talking about agreements, it's important to understand that these three programs and services under the new, le new legislative framework and their specific requirements for funding applicability. There are three main types of programs and services that conservation authorities can offer. The first is category one or mandatory programs and services. And on our next slide, we're gonna find out more information in terms of what that means. The second slide is uh, category two or municipal programs and services. These are uh, programs and services that a conservation authority ag agrees to provide uh, on behalf of a municipality through a memorandum of understanding or another type of agreement. For these types of agreements, the municipality must be situated wholly or partially in its watershed. The third category is referred to as other programs and services. And these are programs and services that the authority may determine are advisable to further the objects of the act. This is typically done at the direction of the Conservation Authority's uh, members, more commonly referred to as their board of directors. And these programs and services may be funded using municipal funds, but only when a cost apportioning agreement is entered into between the Conservation Authorities and the municipalities. So what exactly are mandatory programs uh, for Conservation Authorities? You can see the, the list on your, on your uh, screen here, but generally these um, programs and services are mandatory for all conservation authorities to provide. And as such, they are eligible for costs to be apportioned to municipalities without a, requiring an agreement to be put in place. And while I said at the outset that the focus of today's session uh, is phase two of the transition period and is based on the regulations that were released by MECP in the fall of 2021. There were uh, regulations that were more recently released in April 2022, which will have an impact on the design of your agreements. 
For example, the mandatory programs and services regulation, transition plans and, and agreements regulation, budget and apportionment, apportionment regulation and determination of amounts for specified municipalities regulation, all will apply uh, to the agreements as well as the minister's fee classes policy, which provides additional guidance to conservation authorities uh, regarding the contents of their agreements. In summary though, uh, even though there are a variety of different regulations that apply, conservation authorities are required to enter into an MOU or an agreement uh, to provide a municipal program or service, which is also referred to as cat category two, and enter into a cost apportioning agreement uh, where with the municipality where a CA wishes to finance other programs and services um, through apportioning costs to a municipality. So as I mentioned, there's a variety of different regulations and uh, policies that apply to these agreements. So you might be wondering what are the requirements for these agreements. So over the next couple of slides, we're gonna cover off on the requirements, uh, starting of course with our municipal programs and services. Generally, uh, the requirements include that the program or service is to be provided in accordance with the terms and conditions set out in the MOU or agreement and to, uh, to standards that are prescribed for example, otherwise known as having a clear description of the program and service and the expectations. Those agreements should have a provision for periodic review. The next element is in the minister's fee class policy, there's a new requirement to include a provision in an MOU or agreement that the authority uh, should be permitted to charge a fee for that program or service should the user pay principle be appropriate. And lastly, uh, these agreements should be publicly available on the CA website. In addition, uh, the recently released information requirements regulation provides more specificity about the posting of the agreements after January 1st, 2023. The requirement for cost apportioning agreements for category three programs and services uh, is similar. However, the regulations are a bit more detailed for these particular types of agreements. The first uh, element is that the agreement has, has to be reviewed by the parties uh, within at least six months uh, prior to the termination date. The agreements can be put in place for a maximum of five years prior to them needing review. The, the agreements have to have um, provisions related to early termination of the agreement, including a minimum notice period and how it will be for, provided. They also need requirements for dispute resolution. The uh, really important piece I think for the participants today to know is that the, agree the agreement um, must be approved by a resolution of participating municipal council. And the agreement uh, needs to be uh, posted on the website. And similar to um, the last slide, the agreement uh, should include the ability for the CA to charge fees where the user pay principle is appropriate. Finally, the mandatory programs and service regulation includes additional requirements for category two and three programs and services as it relates to the watershed based resource management strategy. So CAs must include provisions within their MOUs or cost apportioning agreements where they're intending to include those programs and services as part of their manage or management strategy. In some cases, a category three program and service may be financially self-sustaining and therefore a cost apportioning agreement would not be required. So now that we've covered off in detail the requirements of for agreements and that part of the second part of the transition period, let's turn our attention to the final requirement for the second phase, which is the submission of six quarterly progress reports to uh, by the Conservation Authority to the Ministry of Environment, Conservation and Parks. Throughout the 
the second phase, there are six quarterly progress reports that are required to be submitted to the ministry. On the slide uh, that you're seeing, I've highlighted two of these uh, dates because they're both really important. The first is July 1st. And the reason why I've highlighted this is because obviously this date is fast approaching and will re represent the Conservation Authority's first opportunity to, uh, to report to MECP on the progress of their transition. The second date, which I highlighted is October 1st, 2023, which is the final deadline to request an extension to the transition date. It's expected if the Conservation Authority uh, is going to request an extension that they would have identified um, throughout their progress reports that they were having challenges entering into those agreements. And that way it won't be a surprise to either the municipalities or to the MECP should the Conservation Authority request an extension. So on this slide, there are all the required details of the progress reports. The interesting thing is that conservation authorities are only required to report on the status of negotiation of their category three um, cost apportioning agreements through the progress report. However, the ministry will be updated on the status of their category two MOUs through the update of the inventory of programs and services and the description of the changes that have been made to their most recent inventory. So the progress uh, reports are to be submitted to the ministry by the deadlines noted on the previous slide. There, are, uh, no there is no prescribed format for the progress reports and it's expected that each conservation authority will have slightly different reports depending upon what was included in their original inventories. So these progress reports, I think, can be considered an opportunity to keep MECP up to date with conservation authority activities throughout the transition period. Circulation of these reports uh, to your municipalities uh, would be considered an optional best practice. Finally, in addition to the submission of the six progress reports, conservation authorities are also required to submit a final report to the MECP at the end of the transition period. Uh, this report will include the final version of the program and service inventory, as well as confirm confirmation of entry into the necessary cost apportioning agreements for category three. These reports are due to the MECP by January 31st, 2024. So this slide provides an overview of the key dates for conservation authorities and municipal partners to keep in mind throughout the transition period. The first two are highlighted in yellow, and that is because they are already complete. And this represents the first phase of the transition period. The second phase are the ones that are not highlighted. Um, and obviously we have the, the fast support approaching date deadline of the uh, July 1st progress report. So these steps are intended to allow conservation authorities to be well prepared uh, by the transi transition date of January 1st, 2024. So I'll now pass this on to uh, Amber to provide a municipal perspective on the second phase. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Leslie. Um, so what we wanted to do today was make sure that um, A, you saw both of our faces for, um, I know Leslie and Bonnie and Kim are, are well known in the CA community. And I noticed that there's about sort of 66% of, of folks on online that are from the CA community. Um, hello to the, the those, um, the remainder that are municipal focused. Um, and I wanted to make sure that uh, you knew that um, not only you heard what I'm saying to, uh, to municipalities, but that CA is also here as well to make sure that we're all sort of singing from the same song sheet. Um, I want to start with sort of the transition progress so far um, on slide 18. I think what's interesting, um, sorry, let's see if you could just move to the, ne the next slide or do you not, um, oh, perfect. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so basically, and I, I can answer the first question right off the bat that all participating municipalities should have received a copy of the CA uh, transition plan. You'll see through my slides that I've put them as plural in case there was more than one CA. Um, by the end of December 2021, they were due to the ministry and, and should have been um, 
uh, circulated around to, to each of those participating municipalities. That plan is to include the timeline for the first and second phases of the transition period that, that Leslie kindly went through um, and that this copy should be sent and published on the website and sent to the ministry. It's my um, understanding that all of them have been submitted, so, um, so that's done. And then this inventory to the second piece you should have received by February 28th of 2022. So that is for each program and service that the CA intends to or is already providing to you, including the estimated total annual cost, according to those three categories that Leslie mentioned, not only the mandatory, but also the municipal and other, um, and that it can be adjusted through the, the transition period. So one thing that I've heard um, and sort of discussing with some folks is, does the inventory need to be updated based on each of these progress reports? Uh, the short answer is yes, where they are being changed. And so that's one of the, the key takeaways, I think, for uh, municipalities on this call and, and CA partners to be aware of is that it is intended to be an evolution uh, between now and transition as opposed to a static document um, from, from the end of February onwards. On the next slide, I've sort of put together some pre-municipal election strategy pieces. So uh, as we're well aware, the municipal election is October 24th of this year. And so uh, this transition goes right in between those things. And so one of the things that um, Conservation Ontario and AMOR are well aware of um, and very cautious of is making sure that, um, that staff are uh, negotiating and talking through it, but that councils are up to speed both between now and October and then afterwards as, as new councils come in. So if CAs are not consulting with participating municipalities, it is a two-way street. So if you have not started um, or have heard from the other, now is the time, is, is message number one. The other thing is necessary steps should be taken to enter into these agreements with participating municipalities, and that is the category three piece of it, um, as, the, as well as the six progress reports. Um, municipalities really need to be engaged at this point this point. I've heard from some that they haven't heard, um, CAs haven't heard from municipal partners and vice versa. And I think now is um, is absolutely the chance to talk about the inventory. Um, specifically, and I'll get into this in a little bit, um, the municipalities that have more than one CA in their jurisdiction, there's some best practices that we've sort of suggested. Um, but the fact that really it's a, it's an update on progress between now and when uh, the last one's due, which is October 2023. The intention really is to make sure that uh, negotiations are going well and that the ministry is up to speed and that both folks feel um, and partners feel like they're being heard from the other party. On the next piece, we talk about um, the best practices for councils. So I've said this a, a, a lot, uh, obviously one-on-one, -on -one, but I want to reiterate this message is the consultation process. Um, nope, sorry, you are right on page 20 it was great, um, is that uh, you really need to consult early and often with um, all of them in your jurisdiction and coordinate as much as possible. And looking closely at this inventory, I know that we've said that they sort of change, um, you know, during these progress reports. And I think part of, partly it's making sure that, that councils and staff, if they're delegated this activity, which is sort of my recommendation, is to submit changes um, where possible and making sure that people are sort of having the data ready to ground truth on both sides of it. Um, I think there's some areas where, um, you know, some CAs are doing more than others. And some municipalities aren't necessarily aware of the, the depth and breadth of some of the services that are being offered. And it's a good opportunity to sort of learn from each other. Obviously, if there's any difficulties that need to be sort of sorted out um, and experienced on either side, um, it's a good way uh, to make sure that the transition to the new regime is, is successful, but making sure that they're noted so that they can work uh, be worked through. Um, the entering into the MOU or other such agreements for category two and those cost apportioning agreements is another sort of FYI. And I think Leslie did a great job, so I won't go into much detail except to say that category three agreements, that deadline of October 2023 is for those cost apportioning agreements. And it's my understanding that if they're not signed by January 2024, uh, um, that those those uh, programs and services don't have an agreement. And so the intent is to have every single um, agreement in place by that date. And then obviously, as I say, having data ready to make sure that um, councils wish to continue what's in the inventory. And if um, there are things that are missing from the inventory, making sure that they are captured as well. 
on the next slide, talking about working with multiple uh, CAs, so best practices, communication. Um, I've heard that some municipalities are asking all CAs to come to the same municipal budget meeting, which I think is a, a great next step um, whenever that whenever that happens. There's some that are having all of them come to the table at the same time, um, or there's at least a group in the municipality that are meeting jointly with staff to go through each of the inventories. Keeping a close eye on timelines, obviously, um, it, is, it is a CA-led process, but it absolutely will take uh, coordination, cooperation with municipal players, and so it's just as important to make sure that um, that CAs are meeting their timelines. It's an extension of us um, as one of the the key funders for these services. Uh, the new system is going to mean significant changes for some, but less for others, and so that's just um, you know even if you've got a uh, multiple CA and one's larger than another, doesn't mean they're any less significant. What I mean is that um, I think some of the the inventories will need to be looked at closer um, than others, and wherever we can find sort of overlap and um, and sort of better understanding of, of who's doing what I think will be helpful in this process of negotiation. Um, we've said this in a, a previous uh, session that we did about the fact that negotiations are public and so just being aware that councils need to be aware of and sometimes manage conflicting views um, and any negotiation as they would but um, staff I think should be really charged with speaking to the CAs and then communicating the council's perspectives and, and reporting back as to how negotiations are going. So finally on the hurdles and best advice for success um, I've asked for patience. Um, I've heard uh, great things so far. So um, I think the smoother the process can go and, and showing sort of empathy and working together, the better. Um, the upcoming timelines, some are very close to um, the election, but also July 1st is the first one. Um, working together and recording some of the process um, and the progress challenges, if there are any. Making sure that staff are reporting back to councils on a regular basis. I would say to the staff on the call um, and elected officials, it's something that um, Leanne and I consistently go to our board with updates. Um, and those boards are are all elected so um, they're aware that that this is going on and and is something that uh, as I say down below the website um, and the conference is is definitely a priority for us to sort of stay connected stay updated and provide some resources and and Leanne's provided some of those links in the uh, the chat function the one in particular I would say and I've, I've added a link in case folks are going to the conference but there is a concurrent session that we've called the Great Reset, and it's quite deliberate, um, and it was based on on the the four great speakers that we're going to have, um, two from CAs and uh, two from the municipal sector. It's really the idea of um, there's a lot of amendments that have been made to the CA Act back from 2017, 2019, 2020, and I think this is the um, now that both phases are done, so it's phase two of two under the the previous government. So we'll see what what happens um, on Friday and beyond, but um, it is a real opportunity for folks to uh, to get together and sort of strengthen existing relationships, build new ones, um, and reset, so to speak, if, uh, if necessary. I will, uh, my last slide, and then I'll pass it back to Leslie, is just some of those resources that I've put on. It's it's wordy. Um, there are five fact sheets from phase one. Um, based on the questions that we get today, uh, Leanne and I are going to put together fact sheets for phase two as well, um, based on the the excellent information that Leslie has got. But the um, the AMO website is, is up to date, and if there's any questions, both um, Leanne's and my contact information is on there. Uh, but with that, I'll pass it back to Leslie to talk about uh, your resources. Great, thanks so much for that, Amber. It's always helpful. I think we, you know, we talk very, uh, you know, very carefully about what the legislation and the regulations speak to, but ultimately it does come down to relationships. So I think your context was particularly helpful in that regard. So um, as Amber said, AMO has a number of resources available on their website. Conservation Ontario also has a number of resources available on their website, both on the public side as well as their member side. Uh, and on the member side particularly, we have a lot of implementation support materials, as well as some examples as you're working through uh, the second phase of the transition period. So just to, to wrap up the presentation portion of this webinar, I um, we thought it would be helpful to recap in terms of what's next for conservation authorities and municipalities. Um, so in terms of the next steps for the uh, transition period, as I said at the outset, conservation authorities are to consult with the participating uh, municipalities on their inventories. Uh, conservation authorities and municipalities are take to take steps towards entering into the memorandum of understanding 
for their category two or municipal programs and service agreements uh, and or cost apportioning agreements um, for a category three by the transition date of January 1st, 2024. In addition, uh, conservation authorities are to provide regular updates to MECP uh, via the progress reports. So I think there'll be likely some questions related to the, um, the second set of regulations that were released by MECP more recently in April. So right now the tentative plan would be that there's gonna be a future webinar uh, hosted by AMO and Conservation Ontario to cover off on the budget and apportionment regulations. Uh, we're thinking probably early 2023 to allow for the new municipal governments uh, to be in place and um, to help us prepare for the new budgeting process for January 1st, 2024. So um, with that, I will uh, wrap up the presentation. Thank you to, to Amber uh, for jointly presenting with me and uh, we'll be joined by Leanne and Bonnie as we open up uh, questions from the audience. Thank you both so much. So thank you to uh, Amber and Leslie for taking us through that presentation. As a reminder to all participants, if you have questions for our presenters or Bonnie Fox, uh, CEO's Director of uh, Policy and Planning, please enter it into the Q&A box, which is accessible in the bottom panel bar. If a question that somebody has already posted resonates with you, hit the thumbs up to help you identify the questions you'd uh, most like posed during the discussion period. And uh, we'll now turn it over to Leanne Souter, who's a policy advisor with the Association of Municipalities of Ontario, and she will moderate the questions and answer period of the session. So over to you, Leanne. Great, thank you so much. So wanted to get started with a question that I was interested in, and we have some questions coming in through the Q&A as well, but we'll get it started with um, just, just a reminder to our audience when progress reports are to be submitted and are they going just to the MECP or will they be shared with member municipalities as well? Okay, thanks Leanne, I'll, I'll start off and certainly Amber and, and Bonnie, feel free to, to jump in. So the first progress report is due uh, July 1st, 2022. So it's very quickly approaching and keeping in mind as well that that's a holiday. So I suspect most people will be aiming for a June 30th uh, submission at, uh, at the last the latest. So the reports themselves are due directly to the MACP. Um, there isn't a legislative or regulatory requirement for the conservation authorities to share those reports uh, with the municipalities uh, because I think this is really the MACP's opportunity to be kept up to date with what's going on with the CAs through the transition period. But I think there'll be a number of CAs who may choose to share those uh, transition uh, or to share those reports with their municipal partners, just to keep them up to date in terms of what their plans are and what they think the next steps are as they move through the transition period. That's a great answer. Um, I would just echo and just say, yes, best practice, um, but completely agree there is no, um, there's no mandatory requirement to share it with with member municipalities but um, in an era of, of strong and uh, two-way communication I think it's uh, a good best practice to consider thank you all so much in the Q&A uh, and a reminder to everyone if you do have a question please submit it and we'll be sure to answer it we have some time to answer questions now so a uh, question that came in early in the session is when should municipalities expect to receive their inventory of programs and services and what should they do if they've not received anything? I can start by saying uh, February 28th, 2022. Um, and so that's when they, they um, then are around um, should have received it because that was the deadline to go into um, the ministry. Um, and in terms of who to talk to, I think from the municipal side, um, absolutely right to Leanne and I, but Bonnie and uh, Leslie might have additional uh, details to provide Bonnie. Yeah, just um, so those would have been circulated to the participating municipalities. Um, and so, as Amber said, the participating municipalities should have received it by the end of February uh, 2022. And um, uh, I would contact the local conservation authority if, uh, if a municipality has been missed. 
Um, and I would also point out that these are posted on the local conservation authorities' websites as well. So they are um, publicly available if it turns out that maybe you're not a participating municipality, which is a fine, you know, detail. Great, thank you so much. Another question that we have in the Q&A is, has anyone developed a precedent agreement for category two programs and services? Anything that anyone can share on that? Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in. So we, um, the, the Association of Municipalities of, of Ontario and Conservation Ontario did uh, develop a template MOU as part of some earlier work that we did um, through our client service and streamlining initiative. So there is a template MOU available on, uh, I think both of our websites for planning services. Um, Conservation Ontario has been having regular meetings with, with its members to talk about best practices. And so I think in some cases, there uh, have been some informal agreements shared, but um, there is, other than the template that was developed by AMO and CO, there isn't a, a specific um, sort of standard agreement available. Great, thank you. And I can share that template in the, um, in the chat as well before we go today. So the next question is, uh, this is a good one. Uh, can, can, I, can you explain what a participating municipality is? And get some yeah, clarification sorry. on that. <laughs> sorry for that. Um, yes, so the participating municipalities are those that are part of the general membership of the conservation authority. So um, they are the ones who appoint the representatives on the conservation authority board. And they are um, the ones that are levied or you know, pay, uh, have that budget relationship with the conservation authority. Um, and, uh, and, and in terms of like defining of the general membership of the board, it could be done through an order in council. There may be agreements um, across the municipalities in the watershed in terms of who is part of the uh, membership, but um, that's not the legal definition of participating municipality. You can find that in the Conservation Authorities Act, but that's my common language way to describe it. And I know we all appreciate the common language. So thank you so much, Bonnie, for that. Just a comment in the Q&A as well. Uh, someone has put that based on the first question, CAs may share their first quarterly report with their board and that that will in turn be relayed back to partner municipalities. So that's an approach that, that can be used. And then another question that's just come in is, can you confirm that a category two MOU does not require a municipal council resolution, but that a category three cost apportioning agreement does? Yeah, I'll, I'll start off and I think I'll maybe pass this to, to Amber for further discussion. But I think um, under the Conservation Authorities Act and the regulations, that assessment is correct. It's only the category three uh, program and service agreements that require municipal resolution, category two does not. But I, that doesn't mean necessarily, um, like each municipality will have their own procurement process and policies, right? And so um, a municipality may have a bylaw that requires those types of agreements to go uh, to municipal council for resolution. Um, and so there might be uh, different requirements depending on the depending on the standards of the municipal partner that's involved. Yep, absolutely. I don't even have to, uh, to add any more, Leslie. It's, it's helpful that category three is, is the one to, to watch in terms of that agreement. But, um, you know, the different conversations around the budget and, and how um, folks are going to pay is definitely part of that negotiation that should be happening between now and, uh, and certainly January 1st, 2024. Also, um, municipal councils do budgeting differently. So I know some do four-year budget cycles, other ones do two as well. So it's just important to keep those timeframes in mind. Great, thank you both. So recognizing that later this year, there'll be a municipal election, I just wondered if we could talk a little bit about training for new councils and how this might, uh, might work best for both conservation authorities and municipalities. So um, how can CO, uh, Conservation Ontario Authority and, and AMO support uh, our audience, I guess, and maybe we can hear some feedback in, in the uh, chat or Q&A on this, 
And how do we approach um, ensuring that new councillors are, are trained on these changes and what it means for the next four years of, of a council term? So I'll, I'll start from the, the elected um, perspective. I think um, some of the things that we've heard from an elected point of view is um, to, to Bonnie's thing about plain language. It's it's incredibly dense. Some uh, uh, Most of us have been on the the uh, CA working group for uh, a number of years. Um, the, the detailed regs are very um, complicated. Uh, they don't overlap, but in some cases um, they're sort of split screen to sort of describe to, to us. So it's um, if this is not coming across clearly, it's not uh, it's not you. So um, it's really the the um, the fact that there's been sort of, you know, a series of over five different regulations that have sort of come in um, in, the, in the last couple of years, particularly around the phases. I think in terms of educating councils, I think it's about the plain language. What does it mean? What does it mean from a budget and apportionment standpoint, which I think is why that um, that next one in 2023 is going to be very important. I'd also say um, the ministry obviously could not participate today um, as they as they can't. Um, and they did put out some guidance for for CAs in particular about um, what these changes mean right before the writ dropped, but it would also be helpful um, to continue having some of those consultation sessions, um, particularly in the in the summer and fall, uh, to prepare councils coming in um, and leaving as well in terms of what um, what budgets need to happen because most of it's going to happen in in 2023. And and Leslie, do you want to add from a CO perspective? Yeah, certainly. Um, and and I totally agree, uh, Amber. Uh, the regulations are dense, they are confusing. As I said, you know, today we were talking about phase one as it relates to the second phase of the transition period. So it's even confusing in terms of the language. And even though we were focusing on those sets of regulations, we had to acknowledge that the more recent set of regulations will influence how we enter into agreements. So there is a lot of overlap uh, and challenge in terms of understanding what all the leg uh, regulatory requirements are. So I think uh, the fact sheets that AMO has developed as well as Conservation Ontario, I think are really helpful in terms of a plain language understanding. Um, and we, I think both have been working with our collective memberships to provide some training to ensure that we are at a level of understanding that's helpful. So um, conservation authorities, their board members are primarily elected officials as well, right? And so I, I know that conservation authorities will be dedicating a significant portion of their uh, future meetings of their other membership to educating them in terms of what the uh, regulations mean from a day-to-day -day perspective and ensuring that, uh, that they're well prepared uh, to have all those agreements in place prior to the transition date. So I think maybe if you are a Conservation Authority board member, you know, expect a, a fair amount of training and consultation over the next two years as, as we work through this process. Great, thank you both so much. And I don't see any, any other questions from the audience in the chat, which means I think that we've covered off a lot of the important details and hopefully everyone is leaving with a good understanding. And as Amber said a few times, if not, you can always reach out to us for more. And she's gonna say something else right now as well. I am only that there's one in the chat. Oh my goodness, yeah, thank no, you. No, that's Sorry, okay, it just came chat. in. Thank you. So in the chat, uh, we have a question. Are the terms general and special levy used in the regulations related to category one programs and services? For instance, a general levy may be apportioned as a general benefit to all, particip all participating municipalities, whereas a special levy may be levied to one or more benefiting municipalities. So maybe just a, a bit of a discussion around that. Yeah, so I'll start out, start it off, but I'll be, uh, I think, leaning on Bonnie here uh, to help me out with the answer. Um, but I, in general, I would just say that, that that will be sort of the focus of our next webinar when we get into the budget and apportionment regulation. But traditionally, most people are familiar with the term levy uh, and special and, and benefiting levy. However, we are transitioning from that language to new language instead of levy, we're talking about apportionment. And then we're talking specifically as it relates to uh, category two and category three. So be prepared for sort of new language as well uh, as you um, start to develop your 2024 budget. And that maybe answers the next question that we had in the Q&A, which is, is it budget year 2023 or 2024 most effective? 
Yeah, so the, the budget year of 2024 will be the most effective. Uh, however, obviously most conservation authorities start their consultation with their municipalities earlier on. Uh, so likely you'll start to see this new language and this new system uh, earlier like or mid uh, 2023. Wonderful, thank you. And I'm just checking the chat and the q and I don't see any questions that we haven't <laughs> answered. <laughs> Sorry about that, Lee. No, that's wonderful, thank you. I'm, I'm watching a few things, so I appreciate the help. So one last question and not specifically related to these regulations of phase one and phase two, but I'm just wondering if, if you could comment on how you envision these changes making it easier uh, for municipalities and conservation authorities to work on climate change initiatives. Uh, in their communities as we move forward, because we know that's top of mind for many municipal councils and 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 staff. And, and I'm just wondering if there's an opportunity there with these changes to, to work on some of those things. I'd, I'd start and say absolutely. I mean, um, I'm a no, I'm, I'm not disillusioned uh, at all to think of how much work is going in uh, from CAs right now to to get to this new um, the new framework. So there's a lot of um, a lot of empathy from uh, from my side in particular to say I know that there's a lot going on. But what I do think this affords us um, both partners is the line of sight and transparency into the types of services and programs that are going to be offered and where. Where, uh, where best that can be maximized in terms of climate change initiatives. I know that in category one, um, there are mandatory programs and services. In category two and three, there's a bit more leeway on both. And so, um, you know, as we go through and there's more line of sight into uh, not only the program and service, but how it's paid for in terms of um, siphoning off between what's a category one type of service, um, two and three, I think is... Uh, uh, it provides more line of sight into um, how to integrate some of those those climate change initiatives into those, recognizing that there's still a lot of work to do to get us in, into that new language. But Leslie, would you agree or, or have a also? Yeah. yeah. No, I, I totally agree. And I think especially as we get into these conversations about, you know, what the what types of municipal programs and services the CAs will be offering in addition to uh, the other uh, programs and services that they may be offering. It really offer, offers opportunities in terms of uh, working collectively to address climate change. The other thing I would add too is that there are requirements under the mandatory programs and service regulation as well for conservation authorities to, to look more seriously at our changing climate. So um, that particularly relates to our uh, natural hazard functions, which I think have been top of mind for a lot of us as we've experienced all this extreme weather as of late. And in addition, uh, there's a requirement for the watershed-based resource management strategy, which I think could incorporate some uh, forward thinking in terms of, of climate change as well. So um, I think there are some really uh, strong elements built into uh, our mandatory programs and services as a baseline for all conservation authorities, and then the opportunity to, uh, to work collectively collectively with our municipal partners uh, on our municipal and other programs and services. Thank you. Bonnie, did you have anything to add or we covered it there? Okay, wonderful. Thank you. So that's all that I am seeing uh, from the Q&A and chat. I don't know, Amber, or Leslie, Bonnie, if there's anything you wanted to leave us with before we turn it back over to Kim to wrap up today. I just wanted to uh, give a, a, a thank you to, to everyone that that's here. Um, it's another um, last ditch um, uh, opportunity for folks to enter into that survey. The, the flood hazard identification mapping um, program is a survey that um, NRCAN and the province is particularly focused on um, and affords a really good opportunity for folks to tell the status of the flood mapping um, in your jurisdictions. I want to say thank you. Apparently there's 40 respondents already, um, which is fantastic. And so um, if you don't have that link, um, Leanne's put it in the chat already and, and would really um, appreciate an answer uh, by Friday, if at all possible. Um, I know that some municipalities um, have just deferred to the CAs to answer, which is completely fine. Um, but if you have any other questions related to that survey, um, you can you can contact me. And and thank you, Leanne. And I will uh, pass it to, to Leslie. Yeah. Well, I just wanted to say uh, thank you uh, so much to to the people who've helped make this uh, webinar possible today. That's it's really wonderful to have a team effort, and and I think it really reinforces it the key message uh, that, that Amber was sharing today, that it's all about relationships and, and working together, right? And 
And obviously it's going to be a challenging time ahead for the conservation authorities as they try and work through this transition. Um, there's gonna be a number of different pressures on top of our regular day-to-day -day work. And municipalities are obviously dealing with a, a large uh, number of priorities as well. So I think having those conversations early, having them often being honest in terms of what could be delivered, I think will really uh, go a long way in terms of um, reinforcing that wonderful relationship between conservation authorities and municipalities and hopefully help us uh, collectively to um, to, to work together to solve some of these, these issues that we're facing uh, in Ontario. So um, thanks so much uh, to uh, those who were able to join us today and uh, for those who might be listening in the future. But um, and just once again, uh, you know, speak often, uh, speak honestly, and let's uh, work through this together to, to come up with a really great end product. Excellent. Kim, do you have some final words? I do. So Excellent. that's basically that's basically a wrap. It's now my opportunity to thank you, Amber and Leslie and Bonnie for today's webinar. And uh, thank you as well to the webinar attendees for your participation today. I hope that you leave this webinar well armed with additional resources to help manage the transition taking place in the CA municipal relationships over the next few years. So this webinar has been recorded and a link to the recording will be sent out for those who may have missed the discussion. And one more thing before we go, if you have any feedback on our webinar, please take a minute to complete some final poll questions. So with that, enjoy the rest of your afternoon. And again, thank you very much for attending.